My name is Clara Kim. I'm the Chief Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs at MOCA. Um, and very pleased uh, to be introducing this panel, um, and particularly the moderator for today. Um, the panel was organized in conjunction with the current collection exhibition that's upstairs in the gallery called Mapping an Art World. Um, and it's an attempt to look at um, our history, our history here at MOCA, um, having been established in 1979, um, and having opened this space in 1986. Um, and it was really a moment to reflect on um, our history um, uh, and our presence in downtown LA, um, and particularly with uh, Arata Izozaki's passing uh, late last year. Um, it was a really important moment to revisit this history, um, particularly at a moment when we're going through yet another wave of change architecturally, um, of course in the art world as well. Um, I am a native of Southern California and returned about a year ago um, after about seven years of being away. Um, and it's quite remarkable the amount of change that has happened in this city, um, both um, on um, the level of kind of the urban landscape, um, but also the art world. So this um, panel and the exhibition upstairs was an attempt to look back and reflect um, on those early moments um, of MOCA's history and really the beginnings of a, a contemporary art museum um, here in Los Angeles. Um, it is my great pleasure um, to introduce Christopher Hawthorne, um, who is no stranger on this stage. Um, he uh, uh, was responsible for a wonderful panel that happened a few years ago, um, and I think he's one of the most lucid and critical voices um, in architecture, design, and policy. So I'm really delighted uh, to welcome him, um, as well as the incredible panelists that we have today that Christopher is going to be introducing, and I think it's gonna be uh, quite a remarkable conversation. Um, each will give a presentation, and then we'll join, uh, we'll ask them to uh, come up stage, and, um, uh, embark in a conversation. Um, before handing it off to Christopher, I'm gonna give a little bit of introduction. Um, Christopher is a writer and an architecture critic um, whose work appears regularly in the New York Times, The New Yorker, and other uh, publications. Uh, he is senior curator at, sorry, senior critic um, at the Yale School of Architecture. Um, he served from 2018 to 22 um, as the, first chief design officer for the city of Los Angeles, uh, a position appointed by Mayor Eric Garcetti. In this role, he provided design oversight for major building and infrastructure projects across the city, as well as launching initiatives related to housing, architecture, urban design, civic memory, and public art. From 2004 to 2013, Christopher was the architecture critic for the LA Times. His writing on architecture and the arts has also appeared in a number of magazines and journals, um, including The Atlantic, Washington Post, Harvard Design Magazine, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with Alana Stang, he is author of The Greenhouse, um, New Directions in Sustainable Architecture, and was consulting curator of an exhibition of the same title um, that took place in Washington, DC. His earlier teaching appointments include positions at USC, Occidental, the um, SciArc, um, Sci um, and UC Berkeley. Um, he's also a frequent, frequent collaborator with KCET TV, the PBS affiliate in Los Angeles. And it was in that role that he wrote and directed um, the documentary, The Far Corner, Frank Lloyd Wright in Los Angeles, uh, for which he received an LA area, LA area Emmy Award. He also received an Emmy for his work as an executive producer on KCET's third LA um, with architecture critic Christopher, sorry, K the title of which is called KCET's Third LA with architecture critic Christopher Hawthorne. That's the full title of the, of the program. So I'm delighted to welcome Christopher onto the stage and um, I also want to acknowledge the support of the Ron Burkle Endowment um, for architecture and design programs. And, and it was an endowment set up in MOCA's early days in the 80s, um, um, which to me exemplifies the importance of these conversations um, happening in this city and at MOCA. So we're delighted to be reviving that and that mission. So Christopher, over to you. Really need to shorten that bio, sorry about that. Um, 
Good afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be back here uh, in Los Angeles and back here at MOCA. Thank you, Clara, for that really terrific introduction. Um, so exciting for Los Angeles and for MOCA that you are back in LA um, and bringing just re really remarkable um, energy and insight. Um, so I will introduce our other panelists um, and then I'm going to show just a handful of images to set the conversation and, and talk about some of the themes that we'll be exploring in this discussion of downtown and Grand Avenue Arts Corridor and Bunker Hill in particular at a moment when downtowns across the country and Los Angeles is no exception are really thinking about what their role post-pandemic, post-George Floyd um, uh, will look like uh, whether that has to do with return to office or the mix of, of housing and other spaces downtown, um, uh, not to mention social justice, racial justice, all issues that we'll get into today. So we're really, I think all of us, thrilled to have such a fantastic panel. These are all of my, uh, my first choices, some of my favorite, most thoughtful uh, architects and planners, um, colleagues of mine in a number of projects over the years, um, and we will hear from them after I show a small handful of slides in this order. First, uh, the architects Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee. They are founding partners of the Los Angeles-based firm Johnston Mark Lee, whose work many of you will be familiar with, established in 1998. Um, Sharon, in her own right, is professor and practiced at, at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and you'll hear in all of these bios that uh, everyone else following me is connected to GSD in one way or another. Um, she's also taught at Princeton and uh, UCLA, uh, Rice, University of Toronto. Uh, in 2019, she was named Architectural Records Women in Architecture New Generation Leader. I'm actually on the jury for this year's uh, Architectural Record Women in Architecture awards, so stay tuned for, um, for those names to be announced shortly. Uh, Mark served as chair of the Department of Architecture at GSD at Harvard from 2018 to the spring of this year, so just very recently uh, finished uh, a really fantastic uh, tenure in that position and has also taught at Princeton, UCLA, ETH, and Zurich, uh, among many other locations. Um, and the work of Johnston Markley is uh, work that many of you, I'm sure, are quite familiar with, um, including the fantastic Manil Drawing Institute in, in Houston, um, renovation of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, new UCLA Graduate Art Studios, Studios campus in, in Culver City, among many, many other uh, projects. Uh, and and uh, later this year, we'll see the opening of the a new permanent home for the Whitney Museum of American Arts Independent Study Program at the uh, um, uh, Roy Lichtenstein Studio. Um, so we'll hear their thoughts about downtown and some of the work that they've done in thinking through this building, among others. Um, after Sharon and Mark, we will hear from Michael Maltzen, again, an architect who in this uh, setting probably needs no introduction, uh, founded Michael Maltzen Architecture in 1995. Um, and is responsible for projects including the Moody Center for the Arts at Rice, MoMA, uh, Queens, the Star Apartments, um, not far from here, Pittman Dowell Residence, and of course the new 6th Street Viaduct, Los Angeles' uh, newest uh, icon in the landscape. Um, again, among many other projects, uh, after studying at RISD, Michael received uh, his uh, graduate degree at the GSD at Harvard. Um, so we will also, after Sharon and Mark, we'll hear from Michael about um, some of these similar questions about Bunker Hill uh, and downtown. Finally, a former colleague of mine in City Hall, um, Shauna Bonston, who is Deputy Director of the Department of uh, City Planning, um, overseeing the Community Planning Bureau. Um, she, in this role, oversees the Bureau's ambitious work program, which includes updates to all 35 of the city's community plans. Uh, rolling out a new zoning code, uh, by the way, in the process. Um, and she'll be talking in particular about the downtown community plan, which was the first of those 35 community plans to be rolled out. And so we wanted to situate some of these discussions about the history of this building, redevelopment, um, uh, 
uh, and Bunker Hill in connection with really thinking about the future of downtown, uh, this neighborhood, and, um, uh, and more broadly. All right, so if we can pull up my slides. And we will try to save a little time at the end after our conversation, um, uh, the five of us, for, for some questions from the audience. And it's really um, fantastic to see so many people here and so many familiar faces. Um, so we were, as, as Claire mentioned, we were here in this auditorium four years ago, not long after I started in the mayor's office for a panel discussion about the Los Angeles architecture of the 80s and 90s, which we called Strange Beauty, which was, um, which was introduced by Mayor Garcetti, and included, um, I wanted to make brief reference to this, um, a recorded conversation that I organized um, uh, with the, the great architectural historian and critic Charles Jenks, who joined us from his home in the UK. Um, he passed away later that year, 2019. This was, in fact, one of the, the last public events that he took uh, part in. And he joined us um, uh, to discuss what I still think is one of the great books about the uh, architecture of this period in Los Angeles, Heteropolis. Um, it's a book that, if you don't know it, I really, I really recommend to you. Um, a study of the roots of what we sometimes think of as the LA School of uh, Architects, including, uh, including Frank Gehry, um, and uh, Tom Main, Michael Rotundi, Morphosis, Eric Owen Moss. Uh, Franklin Israel and many others. So um, I, I, I recommend the book to you if you haven't seen it. So I just wanted, of course, it's impossible to give a, any kind of a thorough history of, of, um, of Bunker Hill, uh, let alone uh, all of downtown Los Angeles. But I just want to touch on a few key themes I think that we want to keep in mind during the discussion this afternoon. And first is that we are here, downtown is here, and Los Angeles is here because of the LA River and because of the Tongva indigenous settlements that um, uh, were formed along various parts of the Los Angeles River. Um, uh, and, and it's important by way of acknowledgement to say that, it, it's that it's those settlements that are responsible for our presence um, uh, here and LA's presence for that matter. Um, uh, later, after the arrival of the Spanish, um, when uh, this part of the city started to be uh, redeveloped in connection with, uh, let's say, real estate speculation, um, Grand Avenue was known in those days as Charity Street. Uh, I think it's, that's uh, all too fitting, given, given the amount of subsidy that we're going to talk about um, that has <laughs> remade this place. This, um, those of you who know the planning history of Bunker Hill, these uh, parcel uh, letters are not the same as the alphabet, confusingly enough, that was later uh, overlaid on Bunker Hill. So when you hear about um, developments at parcel Q, for example, that's a different parcel Q than the one that is marked here. But um, this idea of, uh, of subdividing the neighborhood by alphabetical uh, uh, letter is something that goes back uh, at least until the 18, 1860s. And downtown um, in that period through around the 1920s was the unquestioned center of the Los Angeles and Southern California metropolitan region. Um, and it's always important to keep in mind that a lot of the um, elements of urban design that we're attempting to create, uh, we're really attempting to recreate in downtown Los Angeles, whether that's walkability, kind of multimodal transportation. Um, I would uh, point you in the direction of these um, awnings which provide a, a consistent level of shade um, along Broadway in those days. But beginning in the 1920s, beginning with the congestion in fact that you see here, as private car ownership became more popular in Los Angeles, it was really the congestion that really drove the development of other retail and commercial districts like the Miracle Mile and really began the process of downtown becoming uh, less central and really one center node among many, and really the, the larger story or narrative of, we're, of what we're talking about today, including redevelopment that we'll get to in a, in a minute and that I think all of the speakers will touch on, is arguably the story of attempts, and we can decide what we make of how misguided or not those attempts have been over the years, to recenter Los Angeles as the preeminent uh, node, or at least the most important of all of those nodes in what became, of course, a polycentric city. 
Um, and in those days, the density of this neighborhood in particular uh, was something that it's all, all too easy to forget uh, walking around today or looking at pictures of, um, of what this neighborhood looked like in the 1960s and 1970s. This is Miller Sheets uh, painting Angel's Flight, which is in the collection of uh, LACMA. And it's very much emblematic for me of what I've described as this first Los Angeles uh, period before World War II when there was, again, this um, a kind of density, walkability, um, uh, and verticality in this neighborhood, among others. Um, but by the 1960s, um, by the immediate post-war era, um, the neighborhood had changed, had become um, um, less um, uh, about uh, single-family properties and, and more about uh, apartment buildings and rooming houses, and it's that landscape that you can see in the really um, important Kent McKenzie film, The Exiles from 1961, which gives you one of the last pre-urban uh, renewal snapshots of what the cityscape of Bunker Hill uh, and Grand Avenue looked like. Uh, because it wasn't long before, like many cities, uh, Los Angeles saw the kind of uh, neighborhood that is pictured in, in that Miller Cheats painting by the post-war period as being blighted um, and uh, started a really, I think even by American standards, unusually aggressive campaign of redevelopment and urban renewal, uh, really not only clearing out all of that uh, 19th and early 20th century urban fabric, but actually cutting off the top of the hill itself to create these flat uh, uh, mega parcels for, uh, for development. Um, this is uh, an image that, that sums that up. Again, we're standing on many layers of, of rubble um, displacement, again, that go back uh, beyond the modern period um, to treatment of indigenous communities. But um, this is an image from the Los Angeles Times. I still don't know who these figures are, so if there's anybody here who actually does know who's pictured here in this 1971 photograph, which has become one of my favorites, please, um, please let me know. Um, and it's connected in that context to the work of uh, Isazaki, which we'll hear quite a bit more about today. He was, of course, like many Japanese of his generation, um, uh, deeply scarred uh, by the bombings in Hiroshima and elsewhere in Japan at the end of the war. And so some of his early projects as a young architecture, young architect, pardon me, work were, were um, directly connected to digging through questions related to ruins uh, and the rebuilding process in um, in, in a number of Japanese uh, cities, in, including this, um, this, this collage from uh, um, showing Hiroshima. Um, and this uh, also bled into Isazaki's written work. This is, uh, I've been teaching a, a course at Yale on criticism that also includes the role of uh, architects who write and the role of publication and practice. And I stumbled upon and, and taught for the first time this year um, a, a very short and fictional fable that Isasaki published um, in J a Japan Architect in 1962, which tells the story of an architect um, named just A, letter A, um, and who meets um, someone he calls his friend S, uh, who had, had once been a, a professional killer, rather famous in the field, an assassin, but who had quit that job to be, uh, become a founder of the City Demolition Industry, Inc. Uh, because he thought that was a more lucrative future profession in the 60s. Uh, so again, all of these connections that, that bring us back to the history of urban renewal um, on, on Bunker Hill. I recommend uh, this little fable to you if you haven't seen it. And he followed it up with a, um, a kind of second uh, version of that same uh, story in the 1990s, about 30 years later. In the context of recentering, as I was discussing, uh, it's right around the same time that we were looking at that picture of rubble, um, uh, 1971, that the Los Angeles Department of City Planning was, uh, was unveiling what they called the Center's Plan, or what has become known as the Center's Plan, which really fixed uh, this sort of multi-nodal or polycentric idea of Los Angeles uh, with downtown as, as not the unquestioned center, but one of many nodes in that polycentric map. And, and Shauna will talk a little bit more about this, uh, I think, in her presentation. Uh, but this is right around the time when formally the city is acknowledging for the first time this and really planning for this multi-centric, uh, polycentric map of the city. If you go back and read this, as I have, I, I um, did some writing about it when it turned 
when the first version of it turns, turned 50 years old a couple of years ago, you'll find that it's also very much between the lines and sometimes very explicitly, not even between the lines, a defense of single family prerogative, single family zoning in the city. So part and parcel, and it's important to keep in mind of that polycentric planning idea was the idea of, of locating uh, dense development in these nodes as a means of protecting the prerogatives of single family low density homeowners. You'll hear a little bit more about this, but what uh, produced the building that we're in finally was the Community Redevelopment Agency in Los Angeles, which was established in the 1940s after the state of California established its own redevelopment authority. Again, the precursor of all of these uh, urban renewal schemes and the funding mechanism for many of the projects that we will talk about today. Um, ultimately, the architect Arthur Erickson from Canada and uh, Isazaki were uh, chosen, um, but the second place scheme, like so many uh, second place entrants and competitions or selection processes, is the one that architects continue to look back to for inspiration. This was the so-called all-star team um, with McGuire partners, um, shown here in a beautiful drawing by Carlos Denise that included um, Charles Moore and, and Larry Halperin, Cesar Pelli, uh, Frank Gehry, um, Sussman Preja, Deborah Sussman's uh, graphic design um, environmental design office, among others. Um, and I think Mark and Sharon will talk a little bit more about this scheme. Um, but what, one of the things that happened uh, in that, um, and, and just to, to, to add one important historical detail, uh, Cal Plaza, which originally called for three towers, only two were realized, um, uh, included a requirement for what they called the Los Angeles Museum of Modern Art originally, which became MOCA. Uh, and set aside 1.5% of the funding for the Cal Plaza project as a whole for the construction of this museum. So again, the history um, uh, and legacy of this museum and this building, again, is, is directly tied in to that complex, I think, case study of redevelopment and the funding that was attached to it. Um, and that produced um, those two Cal Plaza towers shown in the background of this image, but also, I think, increasingly a divide between what by the 1980s had become a really vibrant, um, largely uh, Latin American uh, shopping district and the kind of uh, precincts of culture on Bunker Hill and Grand Avenue. And that division is one that city planners still, uh, I think, struggle to get, um, uh, to get past. Finally, I just wanna mention looking forward because one of our goals here is really to think about the downtown that's emerging. Part of that recentering process um, has to do with uh, one of the ways in which Los a downtown really does remain central uh, as the, the most important node of the, um, of the growing metro subway and light rail network. And in fact, the, the new Grand Avenue uh, station just on the other side of the hill, part of the newly unveiled regional connector does suggest um, I think some of the ways in which uh, that recentering process continues uh, and is connected to some ideas about mobility um, and the long, let's say, long standing effort um, uh, to establish a kind of post suburban identity for Los Angeles and for downtown uh, itself. And I will say in closing um, that the long history of the redevelopment uh, agency, the CRA, is ongoing. In fact, one of my colleagues in the mayor's office, a great colleague named Steve Andrews, was essentially responsible for the unwinding process of the remaining CRA um, properties. And in fact, the Angels Landing uh, uh, plans at the Angels Landing site for a, a tower will be essentially the last of those pieces to be filled in. So the giant mega blocks that were created by carving up um, uh, Bunker Hill in this, in this redevelopment landscape, it has taken all of those intervening decades to, to, to finally fill in those giant pieces. And we'll talk, I think, in our conversation um, a, little bit about, um, a little bit about why that, why that is. So thank you very much. And now uh, it's my great pleasure to bring Sharon and Mark up to the podium. Thank you. I'm M, and this is my partner S, <laughs> also a professional killer. Um, uh, thank you, Christopher. We're delighted to be here. Uh, we'd just like to share with you some reflections and thoughts uh, on the history of California Plaza and the Mocha Building, starting with the second place 
uh, contestant or the, in the competition that started off with five developer schemes and then ended up with two. So the first one is uh, 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 this all-star scheme. And how we learned about this project was when we were students, there was an article published by Rem Kuhas in 1981, read a few years later, titled Arthur Erickson versus the All-Stars. Very unknown article. I think this was the only essay that he wrote particularly addressing Los Angeles. It was published in a Canadian magazine, Trace. And uh, he basically you know, compared that scheme with his, the strategy of uh, the surrealist game Exquisite Corpse that was, I think, outlined in Delirious New York, and then other tropes that was included in his other texts, like Bigness, also occurred in this, this text. So um, this was uh, comprised, this team was put together by Harvey Perloff, which is on the upper left-hand side, who's was the dean at UCLA, uh, together with two other cohorts at UCLA. One was Charles Moore, who was the chair, uh, to the upper left, uh, as well as Eduardo Contini, who was founded the Gruen Associates and was the head or the president of the Urban Innovations Group, uh, 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 an entity uh, founded by Perloff as a practicing, practicing arm and research arm of UCLA that was responsible for other projects such as the Beverly Hills City Hall. Uh, in the middle of the group was Robert McGuire of McGuire Partners, later McGuire Thomas, uh, responsible for the gas tower, the library tower, uh, many projects, also the, the beginning of the uh, Playa Vista. Uh, on the left, Lawrence Halpern, esteemed landscape architect of Sea Ranch, Frank, uh, Frank Gehry, uh, 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 Paul Prazer, Deborah Sussman of the uh, identity designed for the Los Angeles Olympics. Center is Barton Myers in this kind of white suit. Uh, based in Toronto, later relocated to Los Angeles. Next to him was Cesar Pelli, uh, many years in LA before becoming dean. At that time, was already dean at Yale. And then next to him was uh, Robert Kennard, a uh, distinguished uh, African-American architect who is, I think at that time still is, I believe the oldest African-American firm in Los Angeles. Uh, Ricardo Lacaretta, and then uh, the last one on the upper right is Carlos Denise, the, uh, the, the architectural illustrator that, that, that did the uh, rendering that Christopher showed. I think someone that was conspicuously absent was Hugh Hardy of Hardy Hosman Pfeiffer, who did, at that time designed the museum. So, I mean, I think this type of group project was not new, that new. Uh, um, uh, and certainly, the winning scheme that uh, led by Arthur Erickson were involved other architects like uh, Camdesser, Cotton, and Vreeland. Uh, Gruen was part of that team. But it, I think this one was the, the, the collaborative aspect of it was very distinctively traced within the scheme itself as if the making of a city were comprised of all these different authors. Um, so here is an exometric of the project. On the left-hand side is a residential tower by uh, Barton Myers and then the tall office building by Cesar Pelli. Next one is by Robert Kennard. And then uh, the, the, to the far right uh, is one hotel, a grand hotel comprised of two volumes by Ricardo Lacaretta. Uh, right in front, in front of it is an earliest scheme, an earliest scheme of the uh, Los Angeles MoMA, or the, what became MoCA. And then behind that um, was the fifth site that was acquired, I think, after the competition started. Um, the, the zone where uh, a lot of scenes from 500 Days of Summer were, were, photo were filmed. Uh, uh, Charles Moore proposed this Angel's Flat, this apartment building that connected Angel's Flight, uh, or, or reactivated Angel's Flight, and then Frank Gehry was brought in to design some pavilions and stations around that. Uh, I think what is to note is that Lawrence Halpern designed the landscape of the Grand Avenue, and then together with Charles Moore, Design these the, the seams between this the exquisite corpse. So you see, well, I think they call them noses, noses that stick out and smell the street. Um, so, uh, so it was a scheme important enough that the A plus U magazine dedicated a whole issue and cover to this project. Um, here, you, once again, you see uh, the, the the image that Christopher showed. You see another version of the uh, the, the the Mocha or the Los Angeles Museum of Modern Art, like this stepped Robert Smithson sculpture that was tilted. Uh, and then this was the scheme that was chosen. That was at that time called the Bunker Hill Associates Development Group, uh, led by I think uh, Cadillac Fairview. And uh, Arthur Erickson was the main designer. And as you can see, this, this scheme had went through a few iterations too, uh, but pretty close to what it is. The two towers are de definitely different. Uh, 
uh, you still see that circular plaza that bridges over Olive Street. And the reason for that was they were planning for another tower. You know? So even when that third tower was not built, that, that fountain, I think it's called City End, was already constructed. And on the foreground, you see these housing projects that flares down on Olive Street with another tower at the end. So uh, Mocha was situated on the other side of, this, of this, the view of this. So I think there were five or six architects that were considered for this project. Uh, I think Richard Meyer, James Sterling, uh, Ed Barnes, um, uh, someone else. But then Isosaki was, was finally chosen. Uh, Isosaki had a long relationship with uh, uh, collaborative and friendship with San Francis, who was on the board. Uh, here are some of the schemes that he had shown. Uh, uh, 81 was really a scheme that cantilevers over Grand Avenue uh, evolved to another scheme to the right where there's already a sunken courtyard. Uh, you can see some traces of rotation in the plan trying to address that the edge of that land end or city end that uh, within the Erickson scheme. Uh, eventually coming to a later scheme in 1982 that's closer to what it is today with these uh, sunken museum with two separate buildings and a uh, courtyard uh, to enter the building. I, I think it's good, interesting to also note the, the configurations of the housing. There were three units there before, uh, whereas the rendering we saw later, there was only two of these kind of slabs that, that flares down to meet Olive Street. Uh, this is the master plan when MOCA was built, the red part being MOCA. Uh, the hotel, which is uh, uh, intercontinental now, at that time was this kind of semicircular or quarter circular shape. The housing project was built already, and then there were two other housing projects that was proposed eventually where um, Coburn is nowadays. And in the upper right, you see that third tower that, um, that would be identical uh, maybe slightly different in size to the other two towers that were built, and hence that bridge over Olive Street was built first, anticipating the connection to that, um, that site between Hill and Olive. Uh, I, when, uh, I mean, it, the Isosaki Museum was, this museum was a small 1.5% of the entire development, but when it was built, nothing was around here. Uh, even in Isosaki's uh, illustrations of the project, you know, it was like this, Giorgio di Chirico S, you know, long shadows, like it's, does it exist in the desert? A uh, uh, beautiful project, but absolutely uh, no context. And in context he did not know because it was constantly evolving. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, certainly a lot of the, 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 the layout of the program is, is already there. The whole notion of pres preserving a plaza as well as the visual corridor to what would happen behind, uh, which is a hotel now that was, uh, the developer was insistent of creating this kind of uh, an obstructive view to the hotel. Uh, this was the cover of Los Angeles Times Magazine um, when uh, MOCA opened in December, I think uh, 17 weeks or 16 weeks after the opening of the Anderson Wing at LACMA. So suddenly within a few months there were two brand new museums, you know, in LA. Um, but those who were here at that time, I was here, I remembered, MOCA was really like a ship on a dry dock, you know. There was nothing around. There was DWP, there were the two prominent towers. Uh, across from Grand Avenue, the hill slopes down, there were no man's land. Uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, sitting on this huge uh, concrete plinth with a, with a sad stare that leads to nowhere, no one used it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but interestingly enough, you know, that plaza that's controlled by California Plaza with the reflecting pool with the trees were already there before the apartment, before the, um, the hotel uh, arrived. So this is a drawing, you know, of the time, 1986, California, uh, the, the Wells Fargo uh, a compound was there across by SOM, Eric, two of Erickson Towers were there, the, what was happening around the landscape. This is the diagram done around when we were studying the site around uh, maybe seven, eight years ago. Uh, Broad, and as well as the two other apartments across the street. Uh, we're looking at the MOCA in relationship to the cultural institutions uh, on Grand Avenue or the public cultural institutions, including um, uh, Coburn. So this was the plan, as I showed when MOCA was built. This was that reality, you know, where in place of the hotel, where a, a, a different shape of a hotel, only one apartment, uh, 
Tower as well as two, um, uh, the two Colburn buildings. So I think the question is for us is uh, MOCA, when it was built, it was the first building, or first cultural building on this cultural corridor, and now 40 years later, almost 40 years later, what role could it play? Great, so I think um, as Mark sort of laid out the foundations, perhaps of the, at the urban scale, I think, you know, what's, what's fascinating to us, we, we really love this building, and as we've studied it over the years, thinking about maybe that, the sort of urban plan, the, the principles of the plan, and maybe how it evolved over time, so that sort of platonic purity and the abstraction of, of these images of Isosaki, um, juxtaposed against how the site eventually did uh, develop and whether it has to do with, you know, both maybe the nature of the architectural um, qualities of the buildings themselves, the programming, the way that the, the public realm of Bunker Hill has evolved, uh, I think, in our opinion, has maybe challenged um, the presence and identity of MOCA as the city has grown up around it. And so I think as you, you know, seen these images over time and maybe an era a decade ago at MOCA where almost signage and, and other less architectural um, techniques were, were employed to try to continue to give presence to MOCA as the city grew up around it. And I think there's, you know, of course, um, this plaza in many ways was an important part of the connection to the spine that Mark just showed when the building was finished to Grand Avenue, and of course there's been a great tradition of um, art curation in that plaza from, you know, I think Larry Bell is there today, but there's been um, Nancy Rubin's many great projects where art became at some level really a, a stand-in or, or a great, a part of the, the architectural identity giving a sense of place and destination, but always maybe challenged by maybe promises that weren't necessarily fulfilled in the way that the city has filled in or, around the museum. And so, you know, one of the things that we think about um, in, 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 in all of the cultural work that we do in museums and other cultural institutions in cities is really thinking about that connectivity between the thresholds, between the edge of where the city and the museum meet. And so just taking a quick walk through, thinking about some of the challenges, I think Mark mentioned that of course, because of the way the museum was part of the Bunker Hill development, there were restrictions of it, meaning that it needed to largely be um, situated underground, so part of this sort of split level of Grand Avenue. So when you arrive on Grand Avenue, you, you get a ticket, but you really don't have a, have a clear orientation of where to enter. Part of that was also um, about preserving views from the hotel that was behind it across the plaza. Food and sort of the next level of public space was below grade, so it again felt a little bit disconnected from the life of the street as Grand Avenue became more dense. Um, this, this sense of uh, on the opposite side of the plaza looking back towards Grand Avenue that was later on, this canopy was um, designed by Isosaki's office to create a more perhaps, or it was presumed to be a more usable space at the lower level on the plaza. And so really where you arrive at the museum is at the lower level, inside, one floor up from where we are. And at some level there's a sort of almost street-like quality to this space, um, but because it's submerged because of those planning restrictions, it has a challenging relationship to, um, to the life of the city along the street. So we thought it would be kind of fun just to end by looking at some of the early drawings of, of Isosaki of the museum. As Mark showed, that sort of lineage of the evolution of the plan, but really in the end, how it resolved is a building that very much addresses the street, um, creates a void, a, a kind of almost a village-like plan where the buildings frame an open space in between, this sort of very classical in a way, lovely, I believe it's seven gal primary gallery rooms. And while um, beautiful in, in proportion, I think one of the challenges is that this, in addition, well, besides the plaza that leads you there, there really isn't other points of connection that create that porosity and connectivity to the city. So this is really the public realm at the entry level to the museum. This is at Grand Avenue and um, both because of elements like the ticket booth and in our opinion, the way that there's sort of a lack of de definition at the level of the plaza, the museum in a way is sort of 
loses its identity. And I think we find these sections pretty fascinating. I think maybe they're hard to put together in your mind, although everybody knows we're below ground. But really, the, the framing of MOCA is, is, is coming out of the infrastructure of these garage buildings and the lower level of California Plaza. So lower ground, you can see the truck um, in this image here. So it's the infrastructure of roadways, of the parking garage, storage. All of these systems are really the, the kind of limits that um, put the frame for how the museum um, was built. And you know, just closing on this image, we find this a really promising um, rendition of the museum where the proportion and openness of this lower plaza, its connection to the interior street, which is the entry um, here, and the kind of sense of materiality um, of the buildings and grounds, it has really a continuity. It, it seems like an extension of the street and the fabric of the city. And for us today, we still really see that as the promise of, of MOCA as we reimagine and think about the public realm on Grand Avenue. Thank you. Thank you for having me and everybody as a part of this conversation today. It's, uh, Mark and Sharon showed those images of the uh, super team, the super group. Uh, and it's, I think, interesting to remember uh, or to think back about how uh, that work, that time, um, and many of the ideas that were coming out of those offices around Los Angeles as they were trying to invent the city through the lens of, of Bunker Hill uh, and, um, and Grand Avenue, um, how much of the underpinning of uh, a generation of architects that, that has actually been. And I think that's important, at least in my mind, um, Uh, because it asks a question that I think is fundamental to what we're trying to think about today, which is um, what constitutes a downtown in general? And maybe even more importantly, what constitutes a downtown that is particularly a Los Angeles version of a downtown, which certainly some of those early plans for Bunker Hill tried to get at. <clears throat> the planning of Bunker Hill though very early on, was not the kind of cultural center that, uh, or wasn't intended to be the kind of cultural center that we think of it uh, now. The original plans coming out of post-war for the redevelopment largely centered on uh, commercial um, areas, commercial plazas, um, commercial businesses, parking, of course, motels as opposed to hotels, um, and uh, a very large residential plaza. And one of the reasons that that, um, that mix was uh, the primary foundation of the plan was that it was meant to be uh, the replanning, the redevelopment of Bunker Hill was meant to be in many ways the modernization of a city that uh, already existed on, on the site. The housing was meant to replace the housing that uh, was on the site um, originally all through Bunker Hill, primarily um, in single family or multifamily, but very small Victorian um, dwellings. This idea that, the, that Bunker Hill and Grand Avenue would in a sense become a kind of cultural uh, hub, a kind of cultural uh, center, was not something, as I mentioned, uh, originally thought about by, by the initial planners. It was something that grew up, sometimes I think it might have been in response to the name of the street itself. Grand Avenue had to have much larger pretensions than, than a lot of those more prosaic um, uh, functions that were originally laid out. Uh, for the area. Um, but I think this, this image um, is really starts to talk about uh, the peculiar nature of Grand Avenue um, when we think about uh, how does it constitute uh, Los Angeles? How does it stand in for the city? Um, is it uh, an area, a city, a downtown um, that has a more uh, dense mix of of heterogeneous program, um, or is it really the kind of civic uh, spine with a series of, of, of primarily cultural institutions um, as, its, as, its, as its real function? 
One other thing is that in, in many ways, I think uh, Grand Avenue has had the dilemma urbanistically of having to stand in for Los Angeles, the, the idea, the dream of, 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 um, of, of Los Angeles, which has meant that it hasn't necessarily taken on a, a greater urbanistic complexity. I always think of Grand Avenue as being in some weird sense um, uh, a similar, a kind of bedfellow of palm trees and the Hollywood sign, all in a way uh, pointing to, but in a very singular uh, fashion, um, some idea, so, some romantic um, idea of the city. Um, there's a, I like this image, uh, which is an early, um, one of the early uh, uh, planning maps um, uh, in, in Los Angeles, where you see Bunker Hill, um, I think this is, Angel's Flight is right in here, um, Flower Street, Figueroa. Uh, the city, in this image, I think, uh, from 100 years ago, uh, looks like our typical version of the city. It doesn't necessarily uh, look like Bunker Hill or, or the redevelopment area um, as it exists now. But I would say one of the most interesting things about this image and what makes it so much a Los Angeles image as opposed to the equivalent image from Chicago or Philadelphia or New York of the same time is the landscape. Maybe a fiction, um, but it reminds me of, of that uh, image that Mark and Sharon pointed to uh, of Larry Halpern's work um, of the landscape starting to become the important part of knitting together uh, the fabric of the city. And I think going forward, that might be something that we can, we can return to. That image was on my mind. We made an image of the city, uh, a large city drawing wallpaper for uh, two uh, Venice Biennales ago, where we were trying to capture uh, the, the sense of Los Angeles, um, locating some of our projects um, in the city as a whole, um, but uh, trying to get a sense of, of the grain, but also the disconnection when we talk about uh, downtown Los Angeles uh, from the uh, urban core, uh, but really Los Angeles uh, as, as a whole. The reality is quite different. Um, and, and it's been a reality that's characterized a lot of our work in the city because um, as, an, uh, uh, as an architect, we haven't really worked here, which is where most of the architecture is thought about. We've worked more, I would say, in the lines, um, the peripheries, um, the edges of, of downtown. Uh, and in many ways, I think um, uh, that has been uh, a real characteristic of the way that I've, I've not only thought about our work um, uh, specifically um, in each of, of the buildings that we've done in downtown, um, but it's been a way of exploring or investigating how you continue to invent uh, architecture in a city um, that is as disparate as, as this one. One of the very first projects that um, uh, the office, my office ever worked on was uh, inner city arts, which you see here. Um, incredibly close to downtown, but it couldn't be, um, in reality, further apart. Um, really in the heart of, of, of Skid Row, uh, connected to uh, Los Angeles um, by uh, uh, 7th Street. Um, Inner City Arts is uh, a, an arts and education nonprofit um, in collaboration with the Unified School District. Um, here, uh, arts, um, programming uh, became an important way of starting to uh, help to create a center of community um, in a part of the city where that didn't really exist. And I think that is one of the um, incredibly um, potent roles for arts institutions in Los Angeles um, to begin to be real catalysts in the neighborhoods in which um, they, uh, they exist. Inner City Arts is seen now over uh, tens of thousands of, of kids that have come through this program. Um, many families uh, have stayed involved uh, at Inner City Arts. These are early photographs. Um, but uh, even in that early um, uh, period where the, the project was built, 
um, we were trying to find ways for the institution, the arts institution, to not be a completely walled off city. Um, the interior would become more of an oasis for, uh, for the school, for the kids, um, but there were cracks and openings in that wall um, to start to uh, try to um, suggest the sense that the city and the interior life uh, uh, that, uh, of, of inner city arts um, were really much more connected. And that sense of accessibility, I think, is um, one of the important points to be thinking about, especially when it comes to these larger institutions up and down Bunker Hill, but also other institutions that they, as they get built um, in the city. Um, what is the line between the street um, and the programming of, of the inside of the museum. Sharon was talking about that line between Grand Avenue and the interior courtyard of, of MOCA, and I think that exists, that challenge exists for almost all of the institutions up and down this street. I think it's useful to uh, uh, look back, oops, sorry, um, maybe, well, I, I don't know how to go back, oh well, um, at, at uh, Frank Gehry's uh, Temporary Contemporary, where uh, the goal in, in uh, that building uh, was to really break down the traditional barriers between um, uh, the, the public realm, the street, and the, um, the institution itself, large roll-up doors, um, uh, this quite diaphanous canopy outside as an extension of the street, looking out over um, what is uh, this empty in-between space of, of the parking lots um, that are really the inner almost backyard commonly held by a series of the institutions, not just um, uh, MOCA, but also Janum, the Little Tokyo Service Center, uh, the um, Gopher Broke Monument. Uh, eventually they're look they were looking at, at planning a museum immediately behind that. We were asked, um, this is a project I have not looked at in about 15 years. I think it's 15 years, but it may be pandemic time, so it might have been longer ago than that. But we were um, uh, hired to look at uh, producing a new public space in that in-between space of, of the parking lot. Uh, it was meant to be a kind of uh, uh, art park uh, for um, all of the different um, institutions, a, a new form of, of public space. The parking had to stay, but we were building this new park on top of it. And I, th I still think it's an interesting model, not so much the design or the architecture, but the idea that a series of institutions were coming together to try to uh, create um, a new public realm um, that they would all share. Uh, it, was, it was really meant to be a, a space that was both allowed for passive recreation, but also very active events. Um, the form of the cover of, of the parking tilted up into these landscape lawns so that they could be used for film projections and performances um, and, and large arts festivals put together um, by all of the institutions coming together could happen here jointly. We've been working uh, for a number of years um, on housing in downtown um, as an important component of, of uh, I think, what a downtown um, uh, is. It is many different functions, but housing is certainly such a significant uh, part of that. Much of our work has been with uh, Skid Row Housing Trust, which somewhat tragically has been in the news quite a bit recently um, because they've, they've uh, had deep, deep financial challenges, which I think just points to the challenges of trying to do this kind of work um, in a city like Los Angeles. Uh, we completed uh, four projects. We we're in process on a fifth project. Almost all of them are happening, again, not so much in the downtown core, but often at the edges in the case of Carver Apartments, uh, really at the edge, literally 20 feet away from the 10 freeway, um, where the building starts to become, I think, a, 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 a connector, um, or at least suggest a kind of connection um, between these lines that often chop up, divide, uh, and, um, and uh, 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 delaminate the, the city. Um, 
Over time, as I mentioned, we've done a number of those projects, um, including some for-profit projects. And what I've, I've been interested in with all of those projects is, is a question of scale. How do you build and have an effect on the city, um, especially a large metropolis like Los Angeles? Can, does it always happen or have to happen <clears throat> with these huge projects like Staples Center or Grand Avenue itself? Or can you... Um, start to imagine a kind of incremental um, urbanism, one in which through a series of, of, of smaller, more iterative um, uh, projects, they start to create a web that actually uh, has a scale and has a presence and can be thought of as, as, a, as an overall singular project that almost uh, can ra uh, remap the city in the same way that these large, almost gravitationally um, uh, intense projects uh, do. Um, that question of, of, of scale uh, also and, um, and presence in the city was very much on my mind uh, with a project we did very early in the arts districts uh, remaking, one Santa Fe, right on the edge of uh, the Los Angeles River backing up to the um, Red Line maintenance yards, uh, very close to First Street, in between First Street and Fourth Street. I had this fantasy that while Los Angeles and its downtown was really marked by these vertical towers, we were making a new kind of Los Angeles um, presence, uh, almost the same scale, uh, 1,400 feet. At one point, I think, tilted up, it was like the 12th largest building, tallest building in the world or something like that. Um, so you're definitely getting an idea of an architect's fantasy. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, that scale um, was extremely um, interesting to me in a place where um, uh, the project could almost be seen, uh, thinking back at those Isozaki drawings, where it's sitting there in the middle, there's no context. When we built One Santa Fe, there really was no context either, for the most part, very low scaled. Um, and so the question of the, the project was, how does it start to anticipate the urbanism that was going to grow um, in and around it? It was very much on that line, uh, again, between the train tracks, uh, the river, between Boyle Heights to the east and the emerging arts district uh, to the west. It's totally grown in now. When we completed this project, um, I was, I heard a lot of criticism. Um, it was very vocal that the project was too large. It was out of scale uh, for, um, for the neighborhood. And if the city was going to remain as it was at that moment forever, then those criticisms I think were absolutely correct. Um, but in a city that is as dynamic and that as changes as rapidly as Los Angeles does, uh, I think it's important given the length of time that it takes architecture to not only be created, but also the length of time in which it lives in the city, um, that it, it's important to uh, anticipate or try to create a kind of anticipatory scale that might be um, uh, the right scale for the city in 10 or 20 or 25 years, um, and to begin to write into the, the, the design ideas of what that scale might look like um, in the city. Finally, I wanted to uh, just finish um, with the viaduct, the Sixth Street Viaduct, um, which is uh, uh, a project at a, at a completely different scale and certainly a very different scale working on it as an architect because it really is a piece of infrastructure. Um, Los Angeles is a city that arguably much of its identity can be defined by, uh, by infrastructure. It is an infrastructural city, whether it's the freeways and the way that they have a presence in, in, in popular culture when people think about the city or any number of uh, the LA River um, and the way its identity is emerging now. Um, the Sixth Street Viaduct, I thought, could be uh, uh, in, its, um, in its best form a way of challenging the typical uh, way that infrastructure works in the city is a kind of monoculture, that it only really does one thing, generally getting cars from one side of the city to another, one neighborhood to another. Um, maybe infrastructure could be rethought of, especially given the investment that we make in it, 
uh, to take on uh, multiple responsibilities, to do more in the city, um, to not just cross the LA River, but to weave together east to west and also top to bottom of uh, making something that starts to connect all of the different ways people use and move around this part of Los Angeles. Uh, I think it's, it's, it, it's interesting to, um, again, think about what the image of Los Angeles is when we're talking about these projects, especially things like Grand Avenue. Um, what uh, stands in for, for Los Angeles? What kind of image through the things that we make are we trying to, uh, uh, how are we trying to portray uh, the city? Um, is, it, um, it, is it a cultural institution? Is it a public or park-like space? Can it also be infrastructure that starts to uh, capture some of the vitality, some of the spirit, some of the dynamic, uh, dynamic of the city, and maybe even some of the optimism uh, of, of the city. And I, I just want to finish. Um, it was um, very encouraging yesterday, um, hot, but I was out on uh, the St Sixth Street Viaduct because the groundbreaking for the parks um, that will happen under the bridge took place yesterday. There are 12 acres of parks uh, that um, will become an enormous attribute, especially for the Boyle Heights side. 11 acres on Boyle Heights side, an uh, acre park uh, that will connect to the river on the Arts District uh, side. Um, and I think that that, um, I'm gonna end here, the, the combination uh, of, of these very, of, of these multiple ways in which we can begin to make the future of the city and to understand that the things that we're making are not only iconographic, uh, but they are very much the public space for the future of the city, um, is a question that I think is, is pertinent for the way that we continue to imagine um, the, um, the ongoing uh, urbanism of downtown and, and certainly specifically around uh, uh, Bunker Hill and Grand Avenue. Thank you. My name is Shauna Bonston. As mentioned, I'm a deputy director with the planning department. So leave it to a government bureaucrat to take the notch down on the quality of slides. You're gonna see a lot more words, a lot less visuals, um, and a, a little bit about just kind of picking up on the theme that Christopher talked about, like the where downtown significance is in terms of the rest of the city. Um, and a little bit of my experience. So I came to uh, Los Angeles in 2001 hot off of, uh, out of grad school, uh, never having lived here before, having visited a couple times, really like open and free. Um, and by that, uh, you know, a little bit of my background, I, I grew up in um, Northern California where you're taught to loathe and fear Southern California. Uh, so it wasn't until I went to the East Coast and really um, in having colleagues that were architects really kind of learn about the potential for creativity and innovation and the kind of newness that Los Angeles brought. So uh, when I arrived in 2001, um, the uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall was just under construction. I really kind of came on the heels of having learned, uh, again, in planning school about the importance of Bilbao in Spain for really kind of this global recognition of um, uh, innovation and kind of just, you know, the spirit of what people can think about and, and reinventing a place. Uh, so, um, and also in terms of, I'm just going to bring up the center's co concept, which uh, Christopher also had. You had an earlier version of the drawing that really emphasized downtown. I think this is the one that ended up getting published. As you can see, downtown is hardly notable um, in, in the centers. And um, a true fact, when I was uh, on one of my visits to um, have uh, do an interview, uh, the city of Los Angeles has a very long process, uh, civil service process. To, uh, this is the first test to see if you really want to be a government employee is if you can survive that. So one of my trips, I came out here and I stayed with a friend um, and she was to drive me to my interview in downtown. Um, about t 15 minutes into the drive, we realized uh, that I was, she was taking me into Santa Monica because she didn't know where the downtown was uh, in Los Angeles. Um, but having you know, been now for 22 years uh, a, a resident, a working resident of uh, Los Angeles, um, just kind of touching on you know, a little bit of the history too, 
So downtown has been the center, but it's also been an interesting place because of so many annexations. So the city of Los Angeles kind of taking over so many other cities, and we really always did have a history of these other kind of communities. Um, and uh, also, I think the significance of downtown in uh, you know kind of the turn of the century and after that with um, when I think about the history of, of downtown Los Angeles, we had so much growth and space potential within LA that you really had, for example, the, the ability to keep so many of our historic districts in downtown was a result of you know, Hollywood being able to kind of start fresh the development happening there. So you had so many uh, theaters and other places that were able to kind of pop up elsewhere, and that actually enabled us to retain so many of our historic structures. So you have both the newness and the oldness that is in downtown. Um, touching on a little bit of what you mentioned in terms of the history, uh, you know, Bunker Hill being kind of one of the original suburbs, a uh, very affluent place, Victorian era mansions that we saw as pictures of. Um, and it really wasn't until uh, that the introduction of the, the freeway to Pasadena, as well as the streetcars that really enabled some of the affluent to then kind of move out to these different areas, so much more uh, mobility, um, it was part of the kind of downfall that you saw within uh, Bunker Hill. The other thing that I'll mention is the hill itself always having been uh, a bit of a conundrum to deal with. You know, very early on you had, uh, even before the Angels flight, you had a, kind of a cable railway from 1885 that was really intended to get people up. Um, so at that point it was the steepest railway in America. So a, kind of a long history of uh, enabling people to connect to uh, the hill. Uh, so by World War II, those large mansions had been really subdivided. We saw, uh, you know, examples of kind of boarding houses and seen as blighted. Um, it, it, what's interesting, I, I found some, in some of the history too, is there was actually a proposal to raise the hill, like the whole hill, just get rid of the entirety of the hill. And once that concept came out, you actually saw even less investment occurring within Bunker Hill. So sometimes the announcements of big ideas are enough to actually really kind of transform a place. So by the time you had the redevelopment agencies um, and this kind of era of planning where it was acceptable, no longer today, uh, but acceptable to get rid of entire neighborhoods and in its place kind of um, see to a, a redevelopment. Uh, this was the largest and first redevelopment area um, in the city of Los Angeles. We no longer have redevelopment areas. Uh, it was held by the uh, CRA. Um, and I will say that part of a lot of downtown wasn't historically within the purview of the planning department because so many of it were CRA areas and those were you know, kind of funded differently, different mechanisms for development. Normally the city doesn't have an ability to own or maintain land. So you certainly do have a lot more uh, uh, you know, ability and responsibility if you have that. I do have a few images, so we, uh, I mentioned kind of the concept plan. The center's plan from 1970s, you know, again, kind of a response to the largeness of Los Angeles. Um, it, to Christopher's point, it really was about protecting single family neighborhoods. So, uh, and I think this was a response to the development that we already saw happening and traditionally had kind of always happened within, within Los Angeles. So it was very much this idea of building densities within these um, kind of centers, protecting single family neighborhoods. And I think it was also a response against this idea of corridors development too, which we've seen kind of a tension with over the decades, like whether or not we should build up our corridors, which if you have tall corridors, you have single family or small uh, you know, uh, height nearby. So it's an interesting kind of dilemma. Um, so I touched on Hollywood, let's go here. So a little bit about downtown. So. Um, we have just gotten approval through city council, the downtown plan, which really is a combination of two other community plans. Christopher mentioned we're updating 35 of them throughout the whole city, 500 square miles is the city of Los Angeles, so we do have to divide up our work. Um, and then these are a bit of some of the neighborhoods, you know, we were talking about Bunker Hill today, obviously there's other neighborhoods within the downtown area that were uh, unique and with their own kind of features and that we wanna protect. So this spring we went to city council, we did get approval, we're currently in the process of doing some report bats to uh, some of the council offices. 
Uh, you do see with the new downtown plan a real commitment, a recommitment to the downtown as the center. Uh, so, so much growth and potential enabled through our planning process, which really looks at kind of land uses and zoning and construction ability, really doubling down on that as a center, partly, and I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit, because of the lack the, the comparative lack of displacement. So if we're talking about housing, which is really our number one goal at this point, is I increasing housing and being able to house the unhoused, uh, downtown has a tremendous amount of potential, partly because of uh, existing uh, manufacturing and, and industrial, as well as just the potential to build big, build tall, uh, reach that 13 to one FAR floor area ratio. We are tons of into acronyms and terminology. I'll try to be somewhat normal during this presentation. But um, so, so that's a little bit about like kind of the introduction to the, the context that we look at in terms of Bunker Hill. So for the new downtown plan, again, able to bring in a significant number of residents, housing units, jobs, really building on the potential for downtown to kind of captivate this new, new construction uh, that we're seeing in the next, for the 40 year plan. Uh, the plan does look to expand transportation systems, building on this idea of putting people and jobs where the existing infrastructure is and when it, where infrastructure, infrastructure can grow. Downtown has always been a center of transportation infrastructure and it's really kind of building on that as well. Uh, the other thing that the plan is looking to do is really make sure that our zoning and our rules are really flexible. So planners have uh, over time kind of gotten the habit of being uh, having a lot of rules and regulations and sometimes it's worth revisiting that and, and taking a step back. And so you'll see a lot in the downtown area, less rules and regulations and a, a chance to kind of step back and because rules and regulations uh, take time and they cost money. Um, so if you can put kind of design expectations up front and get yourself out of the process it uh, enables for a quicker, faster, less expensive development. So really the key for downtown, opening up the potential for housing, increased height, density, locations for housing. Um, and then uh, the next picture I have, I Googled Bunker Hill. Uh, you saw the map that I had that didn't have any, um, uh, didn't have a, a neighborhood boundary. That's because we don't like to do boundaries. They're very political. No one agrees. If you talk to a bunch of neighborhoods, no one agrees where one neighborhood ends and the other one doesn't. But luckily, Google can do it for us. Uh, so so here, here's, here's a map out just giving us a little bit of context of the area that we're talking about. Um, Again, a little bit more about the downtown plan. So we're eliminating required parking. We're uh, really like in, in simplifying these design overlays, setbacks, minimum lot size, height limitations. Um, we're actually increasing open space requirements and providing a ton of incentives for the construction of affordable housing in particular. Uh, getting rid of process, that's what these things are, conditional use permits, site plan review, we love our jargon, but basically getting rid of a lot of that process to enable uh, uh, that construction. Uh, in terms of revitalizing uh, Bunker Hill, forgive me, these are maps that are out of context, but basically what this is saying is um, in what was downtown, there was 80% of it was single-use zoning. We're actually getting rid of that to only 36%. So if you're looking at this is actually Bunker Hill, some of it was previously zoned for single use, we're getting rid of that. So what that means is that uh, development can basically transition from either being uh, commercial to residential, there's much more freedom, and I think we'll get to this later, like what adaptive reuse means and what it means to be able to transition uh, within the development of downtown, uh, accounting for market needs, and et cetera. What this is getting at, and I won't go too far into what FAR is, but essentially you're gonna have a base and a bonus. And with, this is how we do incentive for development. So basically you can build little or you can build big. And if you build big, we're gonna ask you to provide affordable housing and other concessions that are related to community benefits. I mentioned community benefits because it's a long-standing theme of what we're talking about. Actually, the construction of MOCA, among others, uh, Grand Park, coming out as a result of community benefits or development agreements. Uh, I'm a big fan here of Grand Park. Amazing that it got construct constructed in advance of the development. It's one of those kind of big wins if you're uh, into the legalese of development agreements. If you can ask for the benefit before any uh, construction actually happens of the project, that's incredible. Um, but to, again, just the context of this is kind of a long history of doing these sort of things. Um, 
We are looking with the new plan to dissolve what we had called the Bunker Hill specific plan, which was sort of the residual implementation of some of that redevelopment era, pedways, which I'll get to in a minute, and some other components. Um, and then, uh, again, just greater flexibility in general. I mentioned downtown is a key, uh, uh, a key goal in downtown is incentivizing residential development. So this really talks about some of our affordable housing strategies. Again, you won't hear us talk much about other uh, factors. This is really the most important thing that we're, we're trying to do. Uh, so you see examples of the kind of FAR. We have inclusionary housing, so there's an automatic requirement, plus you can capture those bonuses. Uh, the bonus would be like, again, a larger building, more floor area, more square footage. We have different affordable um, housing requirements if you're constructing mixed use or residential compared to commercial. So these are some of the examples of our strategies for downtown, adaptive reuse being a real key one. And then, let's see, uh, speaking of adaptive reuse in particular, so I know we can probably discuss it a little bit later, but uh, we have a citywide ordinance that's been proposed as well as a local downtown ordinance really trying to expand the adaptive reuse program, which has been very successful. If you don't know what the term means, it's, it's essentially the allowing to repurpose buildings. Um, and you'd think that might be easy, but uh, it's a little more complex than that because sometimes we have a lot of requirements with the certain types of developments that you have. So to to transition it over with an existing building. Actually, the history of having done that was really beneficial to downtown in particular. So being able to preserve those buildings and repurpose those uses is really key. And this, just kind of touching on that inclusionary housing program that I was talking about, we have kind of a, a base automatic requirement for a smaller building. Floor area ratio is really kind of a factor of the cumulative uh, size that a building can be, or square footage. And then you can get really big. Um, so that's the kind of example, the 8.5 to 1 FAR. We do have, per charter, a limit of 13 to 1. You can get pretty uh, creative about how you do those calculations. Um, but that is essentially what we have. I wanted to say, too, that the downtown plan um, is really kind of, uh, we're getting rid of the Bunker Hill specific plan. We are uh, kind of looking at next steps. Um, I mentioned uh, we previously had a transfer of floor area program, which is complicated politically, <laughs> if you've followed anything. Um, but uh, what our new community benefits program does that's really excellent is it kind of pre-establishes the community benefits that we want to see and really sets a, a, a program up that's really meant to be uh, transparent so that everyone kind of before there's any discussions happening about what should happen is clear. And again, really emphasizing that affordable housing uh, as the key benefit that we'd like to see. Oh, that's right, I forgot my, my final bonus uh, picture. This was the Pedway plan. So um, there was a Pedway uh, plan to kind of deal with the uh, complexity of the hill. Uh, <laughs> and it was proposed in the 60s as part of that kind of redevelopment plan. It was, it was part of it, there was also a people mover. I don't know if you guys know this, there was a plan for a people mover. Uh, it got nixed, but not before we had some amazing images as part of the uh, environmental uh, review for it, but the people mover was actually intended to bring people to their offices and then there would be parking garages surrounding downtown. Uh, you can think of a few examples of people movers, not particularly successful. Planners are really into it in the 70s. Uh, it's probably for the best, but you see what's left over in Bunker Hill, some of the residual of the uh, elevated pedestrian pedways. So again, meant to be this pedestrian connection system at an era when we really didn't look to have the street to be activated. You know, that was really an indication that the streets were so problematic that the only way that people could possibly get around is to separate them from that. Um, and of note, it's sort of interesting, but the, the latest um, kind of uh, uh, regional connector with the you know, pedestrian elevation going down, you can see that it's just been a long history of trying to uh, be accessible or have access to, to the Bunker Hill. Uh, and that's the conclusion of my slides. Thank you. I think a reminder in uh, all of those presentations, and thank you all, of the fact that there are many downtowns. Um, they overlap in geography. They overlap also in time, um, as we saw. We have the room, I think, until five, as they say. So um, I want to mostly talk about the present and future.
But before we get to that, I think at least one question about this very complex legacy of redevelopment. So I think we're all familiar with the critique of urban renewal, the damage that it did, the, um, the lack of empathy um, that it contained often, not just in Los Angeles, um, for existing communities in terms of thinking about uh, their histories and displacement. Uh, but also carried in its wake um, uh, significant funding for this institution, which has been so important, putting the seeds in place for this collection of, of cultural buildings that really has been significant in changing, um, I think, ideas uh, about Los Angeles and its place on the cultural map. So first question for all of you, how should we think about that complex legacy? And in the post-CRA world, maybe, what are the models that might emerge to replace it that are not about the concentration of capital and that kind of subsidy, but might um, continue to support culture here and architecture here um, uh, without um, tying itself back to that, that legacy of urban renewal and displacement? I guess the short version of that is, is there anything that we can draw that, that is useful going forward, or is it all that kind of critique that we're all familiar with of a certain era of urban planning that is better left, well, left in history? One thing, I, 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 just to maybe um, color that, that a bit, which I think is, is useful to remember, is that um, time plays a huge role in, in planning, the temporal dimension of cities and how long it often takes for things to evolve. Um, when the Bunker Hill plan was originally, the redevelopment plan was um, put on the table, the one ingredient that almost no one ever talked about was how long it was going to take um, and how many different types of investments it was going to have to take to, um, to in a way, reproduce the city that already exists there. Um, so uh, I, I I do think that that's, that's an important piece for us to continue to um, at least uh, foreground that, that cities are big organisms. They, they take an enormous amount of, of uh, effort and resource, uh, but also time. So when we make these changes, um, I think our expectations have to be put in, in the right place. Uh, terms of what we can actually uh, expect. Bunker Hill has been multiple generations um, to the point where it's starting to fill in. Uh, but many generations uh, lived in the city without ever seeing what it was going to become. And so many lessons about the difficulty of, of keeping that center in place and, and allowing that center to hold. I mean, I didn't mention that right after I moved from the LA Times to City Hall, Los Angeles Times left downtown, and it had been not just an anchor here, but it had been a, a, um, it had been a key champion as an institution of the Music Center, of course, and all of that subsidy that was connected to urban renewal. Yeah, I was just Sharon. also going to say, I think um, you know, going going back to Mocha and thinking and reminding ourselves that Mocha is actually two has two houses. One is here, and one is. You know, as, as Michael was talking about um, at the at the temporary contemporary at the Geffen, and I think the idea of um, you know that 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 certainly there's sort of centers and there's Grand Avenue, these sort of monumental projects, but also perhaps thinking about I mean, if if we use the lens of the arts as sort of a layer to think about community and ways of creating connection, that the constellation model, the idea that it isn't one how one place, but it's actually a network. It was interesting to see your your map, Michael, that you know, perhaps at one level, LA is maybe more successful when you work around the edges, when you immerse yourself in the fabric, you're not going for these monumental gestures, but you're actually connecting the dots across diverse places. Also, just to add to that, I'm thinking about the, 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 uh, the conditions that led to the birth of Mocha being this percentage for art, which maybe perhaps we're thinking typically we're more of a piece of sculpture, but because of the scale of this development that enable that percentage to yield something that is substantive. Now, um, Michael and I, we, we're both working, <laughs> we're new to Dallas Art District well. I was thinking of that moment when an institution was formed as a pioneer institution that eventually a drive development of that one area. So I'm just thinking it would be an opposite of the notion of gentrification where 
artists and studio move to a place where because the rent is low, eventually brings up the quality, it becomes gentrified, they have to move out. But if there's a way to think of putting a cultural institution or cultural institutions in place that they don't have the, um, the threat to be moved away when the, when the property value around it, around it rises, I thought that would be a great model. So it's, that's not always like something that is attached to a larger development for something like of this scale to happen. And I'm glad that you, Sharon, mentioned the temporary contemporary because another lesson of downtown and, and, and of Los Angeles development in general, of course, is that the projects that we think of as being temporary and even give that name to are the ones that end up having, in some ways, the greatest staying power in Los Angeles. And I'm thinking also of the so-called erector set parking lot, which was on the site of, um, of the related Grand Avenue project across from Disney Hall, which was meant to last for three or four years and lasted, I think, about 50. Um, and was like Rasputin in its ability to, uh, to avoid death over many, many years when I was first here. Um, but I'm wondering, from a planning point of view, whether that um, ethos, that sensibility, that idea, which is so important in Los Angeles, the idea of the informal, the temporary, um, whether there's a, a way or um, a strategy for fixing that in how we plan for the city. Is that something that's come up in the downtown discussions at all, Sean, or do the rest of you have thoughts about how to maybe square that circle? Is this on? Oh, good. I figured it out. Um, you know, I think sometimes creating special places happens in spite of planning, um, and that's really something you can't regulate for. And so, uh, I, and I think so, sometimes that's been the challenge of the Bunker Hill area, is like it's so over-designed in a way, like there aren't the spaces that you kind of stumble upon, there's not that like sweetness. Um, kind of maybe tying that to the question that you had earlier too about like, you know, obviously we can't do redevelopment. That's an era that was, you know, it's too improper, it's too harsh, it's too crazy. Um, but do, how do you do value capture? Like how do you utilize development knowing that we have land costs and it's, you know, just, <laughs> we can go back to like the fact that land is owned. That's a, that's a problem um, uh, for, you know, planning throughout the United States. But how do you come up with these uh, avenues to have the value capture or to, to have the percentage for arts, to have community benefits that are part of it? I do think that that can be at a more granular level, really introduced and have some staying power. Um, now that said, it's also hard because you can develop it as part of it and whether it stays or, you know, sometimes we'll do something like require ground level retail. Boy, the number of times you see vacant storefronts because that's been a requirement that doesn't come to fruition. Uh, so the requirements are not all of it, but I think what that is part of the solution is capturing what would otherwise be cost prohibitive for something like arts institutions or other kind of places of, of culture within neighborhoods. I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this issue because it really, in many ways, I think gets to the heart of uh, the challenges of Los Angeles and, and how it moves forward in, in its future. It has, it has very big city problems that need to be dealt with um, from a planning standpoint, um, from an economic standpoint, um, putting in place quite significant um, uh, procedures and, and um, processes for moving the city forward. At the same time, I think a great deal about what um, the identity of the city is and what makes this city unique from so many other places. And I think some of that is really that informality. Um, I remember somebody once saying that one of the greatest things about Los Angeles was that it was always a fixer-upper. And, 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 and in a way, I think that has been one of the extraordinary underpinnings of why the city keeps attracting um, great creativity. Uh, that uh, generations of... of, of of artists and makers have come here because it 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 allows you to um, to work outside of the formality of many cities uh, uh, institutions. So how is it possible to in this conversation um, curate the potential for that culturally to take place? Um, and what kind of spaces would that be? Is it that it's a more broadcast model? Is it that uh, in those um, storefronts that um, there is a kind of uh, percent, not so much for a particular institution that's standalone, but for 
uh, something that happens uh, dispersed throughout a series of buildings. I, I think that's really about the um, existential question for the city as things get more expensive, as resources get more and more challenging, as mobility uh, starts to get tougher and tougher. How do we think about uh, what's, what's really essential about, about this place? By the way, speaking of informality, you know, I really am happy to see Shana's presentation that you're reducing the parking requirements. So someone who's been here for 40 years, uh, I remember the moment when Beverly Center started charging for parking. For me, that was a moment of change. <laughs> you know, that, that was, I thought was, uh, that was, uh, uh, I don't know if some of you might remember the show uh, Kojak with uh, Telly Savalas. <laughs> If you watch any reruns, Kojak always parks directly in front of where he wants to go, always. So back then, when you park in front, you say, oh, that's a Kojak moment. There used to be a lot more Kojak moments. I don't think the last time it happened to me was maybe 20 years ago. You know, but I think this, that moment of informality also pertains to movement you know, and accessibility. It is a major milestone, the, the, the lack of parking requirements in that plan, um, and is emblematic of a, of a really foundational, fundamental shift happening in planning departments across the country. There's a terrific new book about the relationship between parking requirements and urbanism by Henry Graybar, who's a, a staff writer at Slate called Paved Paradise, which is newly out. I recommend it to you if you haven't seen it really telling the story in greater detail than I've ever seen about how those parking requirements really disfigured the city in Los Angeles, as you would expect, plays, plays quite a prominent role um, in the story. Um, but this idea of, um, of informality, sense of humor, looseness, and how to, how to fix that paradoxically in place through planning is such a key part of the discussion in Los Angeles. One of the things that Charles Jenks said in our conversation was that East Coast postmodernists, uh, architects of that same era, Robert Venturi in particular, talked a lot about informality, but they were really too buttoned up to actually embody it. They, they couldn't loosen up. They didn't really have a sense of humor. And of course, the architecture of LA from that period really, really does to speak to a different kind of set of values or different sensibility. Um, sticking with the architecture of this corridor that we have been left with, um, we have this incredible murderer's row of architectural landmarks by some of the great uh, architects of the, of the last generation going all the way down to the, the Arts High School by Co-op Himmelblau and Wolf Pricks and the uh, Cathedral by Raphael Maneo, of course, and, and, and the other projects that we have already mentioned. Sometimes it feels, at least to me, that those buildings can be somewhat less than the, uh, the, the sum of their parts in, in terms of um, how they cohere or don't as, a, as an urban corridor. I'm curious now, looking forward, how we think about stitching those individual landmarks uh, and expressions of great architectural ambition together a little more successfully. Michael, you mentioned landscape before. Do you think it's that piece? Or are there other smaller scale architectural interventions that, that don't work at the scale of urban renewal or the mega block, now that we have finally filled in most of those big parcels, that can be done in a little, in, in a, um, a little more targeted or specific way to begin to stitch those, um, those, those large scale projects together? And what might those look like? I, I know, recent, I mean, not so recently now, but you know, just as an example, Christopher, you wrote quite a lot about the the plaza next to Broad and how kind of complex that was to create that open space. But in a way, that that gap between the buildings, um, I guess, you know, and eventually it now connects um, to Hope, and so it deals with the section of Bunker Hill. But I, I mean, I think that that's right. I think landscape, the sort of untried open space, which is probably always control and planning but you know thinking about even mocha today i mean as things grew up around it i mean it has the plaza and that that should that that is a civic space but maybe in a way because of the way things have grown up around it it's it sort of doesn't have enough definition but kind of reimagining you know the idea of how edges can make connections and so thinking both at the building scale about reimagining how to connect buildings to their fabric and then sort of from, from the outside in as well. I mean, it seems like a lot of Bunker Hill was imagined as a bunch of buildings that sit and there's this residual space. What, am I, what, hap, what would happen now if we sort of went back and maybe not at the big scale, but at the block scale or the building scale, looked from the outside back in and what, how could that create a new scale of the city that I think 
you know, I mean, maybe Colbert is sort of an example because it's multiple buildings. You know, there's a restaurant, you're kind of going in and out, and it has a kind of activation that's a good example, I think, of maybe that missing scale. You know, Mark mentioned Dallas um, uh, and the arts district there. Uh, it's interesting because, in, in a way, landscape was meant there to hold the district together. And there's a Sasaki plan that uh, was developed and is very consistent, and it exists. Um, but it's incredibly formal, and it doesn't necessarily um, it doesn't necessarily provide, and it doesn't really underpin a, a deeper, true civic life in, in that part of, of the city. And I think, you know, there are other models, uh, Burley Marx um, in Brazil, of somebody who understood the relationship between civic public space and, and garden, and, um, you know, true uh, uh, plant materials, horticulture, uh, that existed uh, in that place. And I think it may be a sensibility difference um, that could be important here, that landscape maybe doesn't play the role of, of knitting things together formally. There's a double axis of trees that you know runs across all of the buildings, but becomes a place that really provides for, uh, allows for uh, different groups, different communities to use those spaces to provide shade, to, um, to, to make, um, public space is welcoming that people can co-opt and be. It's always amazing to me when I ride through Griffith Park on the weekend, people say Los Angeles has no real uh, public space, no public parks, they don't get used. Griffith Park is just a carpet of people. Uh, they're using it um, in very informal ways. Uh, it's, it's the ability um, to mark out a piece of, of, of space, um, to have a birthday party, to have a celebration, to have a quinceanera, to have something. Um, and I think that's really a question around ownership. Uh, can you make a landscape in a cultural district like Grand Avenue that allows for those kinds of things? Or is that a, really an impossibility given the presence, the prominence of, of the institutions? That's a great point. I, I think this all-star analogy is, I think about all-star games, the problem with all-star teams is they, they don't play defense. You know? So <laughs> while they make a great entertaining tennis game, I won't bet on that team to win a lot of championships. But, so I, I feel this reality of, of thinking about daily programs like housing. You know, I, I, I think, is, is Grand Avenue like a Dodger Stadium of culture? You know, or are there real life that's happening? And Michael showed that earlier uh, 19th century map of LA. And I would imagine there would be a lot more housing, there a lot more daily life beyond the, the office towers. So I, not knowing what happened actually, if I could go back in time, I would think actually the lot where the third tower would be, where Angel Flight would be, would, should be the first moment of development of this program. You know, I don't know if MOCA should have been located there, actually connect to Grand Central Market, connect to the real part of, of the city. Maybe back then it was something that the development didn't want to do to pre preserve higher rental costs here. Maybe that was an underdeveloped or maybe dangerous part of the city. But I thought that was, for me, a missing tooth with the whole development, on top of the notion of this tabula rasa being disconnected, being not porous enough to connect to the rest of the city, especially on a sloping site. But can you have, I think that's really a, a, a fantastic question. Can you have complexity? Uh, and complexity beyond the Venturi complexity, beyond the kind of formal complexity. Can, what would it look like if, and this is total, uh, you know, obviously crazy speculation, but if you said, okay, some, you know, many hundreds of thousands of square feet of residential mixed affordability needed to happen within that, um, that Google boundary, uh, and that many of the sites for that housing were actually on top of uh, projects that exist now. What would happen if a housing tower was built on top of, of MOCA? You know, I remember uh, Disney Hall, there was, for a long time in its development, it had a, a hotel that was gonna be on the plinth, um, right above where Red Cat is now. And for a lot of reasons it didn't happen, and I'm not sure a hotel is exactly, that's not, the, the, a deeper mixed use maybe than we're talking about. But if you imagine that that was housing that connected to the garden uh, on top of the plinth and it connected to Red Cat and it connected to the street and it connected to the Broad, that's a different equation. That's a different version of the way that uh, the 
I forget what you referred to, Grand Avenue. It's a zoo or uh, what, murderers. Murderers, were, uh, yes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Or the right. All Star. The uh, All Star game yeah, is a better yeah. example. Um, you know, that would be a very different uh, approach to um, how you make a civic infrastructure in in a downtown. Right. I think the op the one optimistic uh, take is that we. The legacy of planning here is about these separate mega blocks and then this precinct as distinct, to Mark's point, from the rest of downtown and not thinking about those edges and porosity. And even the development within this neighborhood has happened in very distinct sections. Even Grand Avenue is as much of a triumph as it is in terms of its financing, as you were saying, Shauna. Um, there is no, there has been very little ability for any of those projects to spill out and sort of commingle, contaminate each other in very interesting ways. I think there is now an opportunity over the next generation to rethink this district, which has been developed in such sterile, separate ways, and think about porosity, right, as, as perhaps the driving force. And that could mean uh, a different approach to uses, to introduction of housing, introduction of, of buildings on top of existing development, et cetera. I think it's a little bit of streetscape too. And, and I hate to think of like a streetscape plan that's again too formal, uh, but it, the street itself is really the problem. And I think part of it is also lower grand and like you've got the barrier and the median, like it just, in terms of your, your mind's mapping, you know, like it just, it, it doesn't make sense. I think no one could if <laughs> rebuild um, it from your head, uh, any sense of it. Um, so I think, yeah, I think streetscape, I think people. Uh, and I think like a reason to wander. If I think about the, the spans of the corridor, I don't know why I would ever walk it. I know I go right. to destinations, and I think that's true of everyone. You have, these are all destination spots, but you don't like linger or waste a couple hours. And what, how and why would you? And what does that environment feel like to go from it's place true. to place? It's true, and I think that's, again, could the landscape in the shade of Grand Park spill out into the street? Could the collection of this museum or the Broad spill out onto the street in terms of public art that was really part of the streetscape that would yeah. take you all the way down across the freeway, for example? Mm -hmm. And what would, that, what, would, what would be required to think and plan in that, in that way? Um, we have just about 10 minutes left. I want to save a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, maybe a last question on housing, because as many of you have mentioned, it's top of mind for everyone, um, affordability uh, and homelessness. Um, how should we think about the appropriate balance of housing and other development going forward? Um, what are the prospects of a new adaptive reuse ordinance? We didn't really touch on the history too much, but again, one of the most successful um, examples of urban policymaking in Los Angeles, the original adaptive reuse ordinance um, going back to the late 1990s, which allowed um, uh, commercial buildings to be tra transformed into housing with a minimal of red tape and one of the first relaxations of parking requirements. One of the issues now, though, is every city, including Los Angeles, is looking ahead to this post-pandemic new definition of work and hybrid work and the future of work and the future of office space. The low-hanging fruit here in terms of conversion to residential of office buildings has already been done. The, the buildings that lend themselves most easily to that kind of conversion are largely pre-war buildings with smaller floor plates. Or, what do we do, and this is a question again every city is asking, what do we do with those big post-war office buildings that have giant floor plates? Is it possible to think about that conversion? Maybe we'll start with you, Shauna, and then ask the rest of you about this larger question of housing. I'm also curious about the responsibility a neighborhood like Bunker Hill with its wealth owes to a neighborhood like Skid Row in terms of taking on the larger responsibility, right, of homelessness. But sticking with you just on the adaptive reuse in this 2.0 version, what are the prospects for some of those larger floor plate buildings or other kinds of conversions um, if office occupancy remains at pretty low levels? I mean, utilizing the ordinance would be key. In terms of the design of the space, I'll leave that to, uh, to other experts. Um, I mean, I think you're right about the pre-war, you know, the windows, <laughs> the spaces themselves are, are difficult to kind of live in. The ordinance itself is being amended. You had mentioned um, it was from, I think, the 90s, but it was uh, from 1974. So it was essentially anything that was older than 1974, and now we're kind of making that, a, a, basically it's a 10-year kind of moment. Um, from a planning perspective, some of those concerns might be if you get less than 10 years, you start to have the prospect of building a development only to have it converted. So you can say like, oh, I'm not gonna build affordable housing 
Um, or you can get out of affordable housing because you're constructing it as commercial only to uh, change it immediately. You know, so there's there's some concerns about again the some of the benefits that we'd normally see some, from some of the development. Um, but uh, that's where I think again, like planners, step back and like let's see what the market brings and what bears out. That said, it feels like, uh, and I'm no you know financial expert, but a lot of those buildings can sit and do sit fallow for a very, very long time, and there doesn't seem to be a real impetus to, to change those over, despite our incredible housing crisis. So, I, you know, there's other issues uh, embedded, um, but certainly this will allow for that potential. It'll be interesting to see how that uh, takes place and transpires. We've, we've done some work around this, um, uh, looking at, at converting a number of different scales of building, and you're right that the Smaller scale, the older uh, uh, buildings, probably up until the 1980s, um, uh, are real candidates for that kind of adaptive reuse uh, for a lot of a lot of reasons. Uh, the really tall towers, I think it's going to be a long time. Uh, there's there's such uh, large financial assets that even with the, the uh, defaults that you're seeing on some of the buildings downtown right now, that's still not dragging the, um, the financial uh, aspect of the building down far enough to allow for that kind of reinvestment um, to chop the building up and to pull a lot of the square footage out of, out of the building. So I think they're, um, those tall buildings for a while are going to be um, really zombies in the city, that they're going to be really challenging for the... Um, for the city to, to deal with, which is why I think it puts an even greater um, uh, impetus on looking at where else you can build housing um, uh, to look at other, other types of sites um, to deal with the need that is unbelievable. It's extraordinary, the need for, um, for housing in the city. The question also, also made me think about like office buildings in, let's say, Germany, where they tend to be slimmer because the, the requirement for a worker's distance from daylight is much shorter than here. And those are much easier to be adapted into housing. I'm curious like, to think about future development of office. Is there a way to give incentive for office building proposals that could easily be adapted to housing with some perks? I'm just thinking because it's, it, it's in the long run, you know, if housing could be the end of everything, whether it's a parking lot or office building, that could be, that could, I'm just thinking about how, you know, the, the scale of the city a program begins to change if we have to adapt to different needs. If that could be something that could be put in place to encourage that for future development. I think it ends up being indirectly encouraged when you have kind of more of the form-based code that's really looking at, like, regardless of the use, you can convert back and forth. And so I would imagine as things get constructed, folks are thinking out 10, 20 years, what does this look like? Some of the requirements that we have had, um, you know, kind of going through our commission and as president or as present in the downtown plan is to have uh, ground levels that if you do have parking, it can be converted. So this idea that like you might construct five levels of parking that may no longer be required or, um, you know, sometimes it's required as part of financing. That's the other thing is you can eliminate the parking requirement, but if, if places can't get financed to get constructed. So allowing that adaptability and that flexibility as a model of construction that feels like a little bit less direct as an incentive. I, I think that's in, it, on one Santa Fe, um, on the north side of the build, uh, north end of the building, um, it's one story of um, commercial and then there's uh, two stories of parking and then there's three stories of housing on top of it. And for the long time, you know, people, the idea that you would build above grade parking was like the worst thing that you could possibly do because it's just a, it's a blight or it's seemingly a blight. But um, that was partially an anticipation of the fact that you would start to see, especially a younger generation, and that was absolutely the case before the pandemic, it's slowed down a little bit, but a generation who wasn't that interested in driving was using more and more ride share. And so the car um, counts would start to really come down. And it's designed that second and third floor parking is designed so that you can start to plug units. Um, you can plug units into it. So I think that that, that kind of pre-thinking, I think to Mark's question, uh, one of my favorite quotes, Aldo Rossi, the Italian architect, talked about this difference in cities 
between propelling and pathological permanences. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it relates to adaptive reuse, that pathological um, permanences are things like churches. No matter what, it always feels, you can try to put apartments <laughs> or condominiums in it, but it's always gonna be a church. But a, path, uh, a propelling permanence is a type of building that in a sense becomes a kind of const, uh, 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 mutable um, armature for change. That you know the lofts became uh, the factories became lofts and they've become commercial spaces. And so I think that's an interesting question. Can you begin to um, approach thinking about architectural types um, in terms of their adaptability as opposed to what they are on day one? And that might be uh, an example of the architecture and the planning of the city finally catching up with that larger ethos of flux, change, dynamism that, that all of us have, have talked about. Um, maybe time for one or two questions before we wrap up. I think there's a mic that's going to be passed. So yes, down here on the stairs. In the interest of time, a uh, quick question if you yeah. may, and then we can try to get another one in before question we question is about scale and being downtown, uh, you started off with the Victorian houses that were subdivided, they got even smaller, and now we have huge super blocks and a lot of these amazing drawings were about huge installations. So I think I see a conundrum in city planning downtown now where to have the new parks, the affordable housing, we're gonna need huge buildings and huge blocks. So I'm wondering how that, the flip side is the street and what we're going to do about the experience of walking on the street when we have huge developments, but we know that small developments really create the streets we want to be on. Thank you. That's well, we, we have some tips and tools in the planning department to make bigger things look smaller. Um, that's not exactly what you're getting at. But I, I do think also imposing you know, some of those requirements even on the smaller stuff gets you comparably kind of a smaller benefit, but that still can be useful. But I, that's a great question, and I'll let the rest of the panel answer. I would say big is not a problem. Uh, relentlessness is a problem. And, 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 and uh, um, kind of monomaniacal planning is, is a problem. You know, if you have an enormous building and all it does is hit the ground and, and it's more of that building, maybe that's a part of the problem. But I, I think that actually we should be thinking about really large approaches to uh, building, building the city. You know, if you, if you look at a lot of the cities that, that everybody points to as being the quintessential fantastic cities, Paris or something, and uh, where Hausman cut these boulevards through the city, and it's it, it's just incredible street wall of row houses, but it's huge. If you look at it collectively, it breaks down into smaller and smaller scales. It feels more and more humane and more habitable, but the the fundamental massing, the fundamental scale, is not actually that small. So I, I think it's more about. Um, a, a finer grain of the way that you approach those problems than thinking good is small and bad is bad is big. Maybe one last question. And um, just before that, I, I think you have put your finger on an important explanation of why it took so long for these pieces to be filled in because the logic of actually developing one of those super blocks is really an all or nothing kind of calculus, right? That's why the erector set parking garage was there for so long. You either have an empty super block or you figure out how to raise the capital to build the entire thing, right? And so um, I agree with Michael's point in general in terms of building the city, but in terms of why these spaces stayed empty for as long as they did, it was because you're either gonna find the money to develop the entire thing at once or you're gonna keep it completely, completely empty and undeveloped. Um, super great conversation, guys. And I love the way we kind of wound up at this place over the course of the conversation as far as the, the ending and is talking about the, the duration of time that it takes to uh, actualize a city. But at the same time, like where you guys are headed with this conversation, well, how does the city over kind of in a planning way in the future adapt or change? And maybe a question to uh, Shana, but maybe, uh, of course, uh, uh, others of you guys as well. But it has um, the Department of City Planning ever kind of incentivized this sort of adaptability of structures to accommodate different things, to re-metabolize into other things. Michael talked about you know, the, the, these kind of Rossian ideas and often mistranslated the idea of the, the architectural uh, artifact or this kind of a thing that can do many things. Um, and I'm curious if, 
you know, we're talking about from parking to housing and these kind of, uh, kind of conversations. We're changing office buildings potentially into housing now. Are, are any of, has any of that ever been in, uh, discussed as an incentivization for architects to be considering uh, in city planning? I'm curious, uh, Chris, also from your institutional memory and uh, you know, in, in your role in the city, has that ever been part of the conversation? I think if I'm rephrasing, it's like the idea of incentivizing adaptability, which I think does come from the adaptive use ordinance. Again, this like a lot of our incentives are sometimes just stepping out of the way and it's about not having process, right? So minimizing the process to do that. Uh, also, uh, I had that slide up that talked about single use zoning. So again, there was an era in planning in which we really separated huge swaths of residential to be kept separate from commercial and industrial. Some of that was uh, redlining reactive. Some, some of it was out of concern for health and safety. It, you've seen it really in the last many decades kind of come back to revisiting this idea of mixed uses being really critical and that kind of scale and, and space. And so I think you'll see the zoning not there, meaning the zoning allows you to kind of do, do what one wishes, you know, and have that adaptability. So that's not an incentive per se, but again, it's indirect insofar as you're letting the developer, the architect, the market kind of dictate those, some of those changes and knowing that there's some flexibility in that and that those neighborhoods do evolve over time. Um, you know, one of the examples I'm thinking of too is we also brought the Boyle Heights community plan to uh, the city uh, planning commission uh, and one of the things that we're reintroducing is tienditas. So this is idea of like neighborhood, uh, uh, you know, uh, grocery stores, which you would think that we shouldn't be planning out, but we did for many, many decades. So they, it's residential only, but of course neighborhoods should have a corner grocery store. That's super basic. So, so a lot of this is us stepping back from what has been decades of kind of trends of planning to, to make places more uh, functional in terms of neighborhoods and uh, complete livable neighborhoods. Great, any last, any last thoughts before we wrap up on that subject or others? All right, well, um, yes, Claire, of course. One burning question, yes. just for, for the artists in the room as well, as we think about the incredible growth of the contemporary art scene in Los Angeles over many, many decades, um, the history of artists moving where cheap rent is has always been part of the narrative, right? Whether it's, it was Venice in the 70s, downtown or elsewhere. And um, given the context now, and as many of us know, artists who are struggling to find affordable studio spaces now, where does that fit into some of your thinking about the adaptable, the adaptable spaces and buildings? Just wonder if you've had any thoughts about, about that. It's a great question, and, and these are architects who have all worked with artists and thought about um, spaces both for the production and the um, and the exhibition of art. So um, really great to, to add that to the to the mix. I think that the history of institution, art institutions, there's always this moment of transition. I'm thinking about the MCA in Chicago. Before they moved into where the building is now, they had perhaps more aggressive contemporary programs. Uh, they didn't have a collection. It was a Kunsthalle type of building. And then when they built that artifact, it, that, you know, it became, it changes the culture of the institution. I think one of the thing about MOCA, having both temporary contemporary or Geffen and um, the Isosaki building is it has both worlds and, and, and in such close proximity and certainly this is a duality you know I also think about museum of institutions that has a dispersed model I'm not talking about this global Guggenheim but I'm thinking more of the 80s uh, dia you know within Soho you know you have printed matter you have a series of Walter de Maria rooms you know it's almost like a biennale type of model but then it's it's permanent you know it's or it's integrated within the city so so it, it engages life in very different ways. You know? I don't know if that directly answers, but I think this motion of this dispersed model of being in different places and different contingencies is, is a plus. That, yeah. I think there's something to that that gets back at the center's plan. I was thinking when you were talking about that, that when I was at RISD, um, I got a job, a developer needed a rendering um, uh, of this uh, Factory he was converting into um, into uh, for profit market rate housing and um, and so we were driving it was in Newark and he was driving me down there to take a look at it 
And I was asking him about it, and he said, oh, yeah. He said, um, uh, I just follow the artists. And wherever they go, I just wait a couple of years, and then I come in. And I was thinking, <laughs> how am I going to go back to all my friends at art school and tell them that that's what's actually, that's what's actually going on? But I think that that economic model is a reality. And uh, I'm, I think it's very difficult um, to try to get ahead of it um, in an incremental way. If It seems to me that um, stepping back and looking at the problem of affordability in the city as a whole is really a, a, a major key to that, that question, that um, artists need to be able to afford space Families need to be able to afford space. Young couples or young individuals, they need to be able to afford space in, in the city. And I think we need to attack that kind of globally in the city um, so that there isn't so much pressure on each time a neighborhood becomes hot, it becomes a gentrified uh, neighborhood because that's unsustainable as a city. You know, maybe another interesting thing uh, to think about, I think we've talked about time in different ways today, like the sort of duration, how long it took to, let's say, realize um, this project. And, you know, today there is, you know, a lot of empty space around this Bunker Hill. I mean, real estate in the sort of lower levels of California Plaza. And maybe, maybe also, I mean, Michael, you talked about sort of operating at the edges. A lot of the sort of Im informal art projects you've worked on have been at the edges of the city. But maybe there's a way when you think in like six month increments and not 20 year increments that you could sort of reoccupy parts of the center of the city or storefronts in California Plaza. Like an artist could have a studio for a year. I mean, why not? If it's empty and there's a, there's a sort of differential of time use that an artist has versus a developer who needs to think about 20 years, maybe there's a gap that could be co-opted in a really interesting way that might bring energy according to a different time, time duration. That's a great place to leave it. Please join me in thanking our panelists.